Thanks so much for sticking around. I'm excited about the guest we have in studio today. He's got over 30 years of experience in the financial sector, 15 of those years hosting national radio programs, teaching you all about money, financial expert and brother in the Lord, Dan mm. Celia in studio with me today. Thank you so much for being oh, here. Oh man, thanks for asking me, I'm excited. Yeah, see, and, and me too, because I, I really only want to talk about things that I care about, and, and frankly, things that scare me a little bit, Dan, and so money. Is it me or the money? Oh, no, it's, well, the money. it's you talking about okay, the money, Dan. Right, okay, <laughs> it's you right. talking about the money. And so I'm gonna be completely honest with you today. I'm gonna ask questions that I feel like I need the answers to, okay. and, and most Americans need the answers to, mm. and then believers mm. need the answers yeah, to. Yeah, good stuff. But Great. before we do that, let's kind of give yourself a little bit of credibility here. How, you, over 30 years in the financial sector, how did all of this happen? Um, I started out, you know, I got out of the military. I went uh, to school at night, uh, worked my way uh, through school, on the, VI, on the GI Bill and working construction. Ended up in uh, a construction company where I eventually ended up taking care of some of their money in accounting and one thing led to another and uh, got on Wall Street, started in a bond, as a bond manager and uh, started eventually my own trust company. And had a trust company, I managed at my peak, I guess I managed about $600 million. It sounds like a lot, of, just over half a billion. It's really not. <laughs> It's it not doesn't a lot sound of money. like a lot, well, Dan. Well, not, not from, a, from a management perspective. I mean, okay. there's, there's guys out there managing three, four billion dollars. I mean, it's nuts. Of other so people's other money. Other people's money. Yeah, this was other people's money. Dan, but me. this, I mean, that, to me, that just ups the stakes. Okay, but you know, go ahead. So, uh, started, you know, I, I did that, had my own trust company for many years, over 20 years. Uh, sold that to a local bank at one point in time. I was asked to start a ministry, a foundation for a ministry. And I said, no, I, it, was a, it was a foundation. It was a, uh, connected to a university that I managed their money. And I was asked if I would be willing to maybe think about starting a foundation for mm -hmm. them. And I said, no, I wouldn't have any interest in that. And the fellow said, would you be interested in praying about it at least? I said, sure, I'll pray about it. And didn't think much of it. But never, nevertheless, my wife and I did pray about it. We prayed about it for 13 months. And in that period of time, uh, I... God had orchestrated some things, and uh, someone offered to, to buy the business. I thought, oh, that's interesting, you know, because I'm praying about this other thing. Anyway, one thing led to another, and I started a foundation, built that up uh, for about 11 years, or not 11 years, about nine years. And uh, in the midst of all that, I was doing a radio program, kind of part-time, on Christian radio, mm -hmm. one or two stations. Then I went to eight or ten, and and I went to 20, and then 30, and then a couple hundred. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, um, I didn't have any real interest in doing the radio program. A friend of mine talked me into it. And eventually, I realized, here, here's the thing. You know, I came to the Lord late in life. Let's talk about that. Let's just go right <clears throat> okay. into that, because okay. you have an interesting conversion story. I, I came to the Lord late in life. You know, there were many things in my life that... Um, went on and many people tried to lead me to the Lord and I wouldn't have anything to do with it. I spent seven years in federal court suing a partner of mine that had taken, taken me for almost everything. Wow. And it was, I was suing him under a federal law and it was a long drawn out process. And he wanted to settle out of court three times. He tried to settle and my lawyers were saying, settle, settle. And I said, no, no, this guy's gonna hang. You know, that was my, that was, that was the old, that was the old me. Right, right. And, um, but in the midst of all that, I uh, was one of those folks in a very low point that I pulled my car off the side of the road listening to Charles Stanley. Okay. And accepted Christ broke down and uh, just was a lunatic for wanting to know more about God's Word. My mm -hmm. wife thought I had finally gone off the deep end. This was it. And prayed for her for five years in, the, in all of this. Again on the radio, I heard someone speaking about his father who had six months to live. And he said to his pastor, Pastor, I've been praying for my father's salvation for five years. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm thinking, okay, I've been praying for my wife now about five years. And his pastor said, look, your father's got six months to live. You need to stop praying and start talking and share the gospel with him. Wow. And I realized I'd never really shared with my wife. She just thought I was nuts. Mm -hmm. And I turned the car around, I went home, I, I, I called her, I said, we've got to meet at this bagel place that we used to go to, and we talked for three hours. 
I also made a, uh, a weekend to remember thing. It's a family life thing. And I made a reservation for us to go the following weekend. Mm -hmm. And she was mad at me as a hornet all week long. She couldn't believe I did that. <laughs> anyway, she came to the Lord. Yeah, yeah. At that weekend. So uh, I, I elevated my, my radio ministry a little bit and really desired to, to work for the Lord. I wanted to be in the trenches. I wanted to preach the word. I wanted to teach the word. I wanted to help people by way of the, uh, of, of the word of God. It was yeah. what I loved more than anything yeah. at this point. And I realized one morning in prayer that as I was praying, God used me, put me in the trenches. Mm -hmm. I realized that I struggled to remember the verses that I was in that morning. Mm -hmm. But I could tell you what DuPont stock sold for <laughs> like 10 years ago. Yeah. What Sugar yeah. Future, I remembered all these numbers. <laughs> and I, it dawned on me that God was just nudging me and saying, this is, this is where you're gifted. I think use that's so that for the kingdom. Yeah, use that for the kingdom. Yeah. And I, you know, we're not gonna hang out there, but I think you know, along the way, during the course of this conversation, Dan, we're gonna have those nuggets right okay. there. And yeah. so right there sure. was just a nugget because I think there are so many of us who are asking the Lord to use us and, and to do these things. Mm. But we have these specific giftings that the Lord says, I didn't make a mistake in giving you yeah. those, and I want you to take those and use them to bring glory to my name. And so your gift is numbers. Yeah. So your gift yeah. is not, I mean, you know, billions of dollars, large numbers, yeah. your gift, yeah, to yeah. be able to remember that and to help people. And so we're gonna talk throughout the course of the show today, I'm gonna ask some questions I think that a lot of people are wondering about. But first, let me ask you this, just okay. overall, Dan, because you travel a lot, mm -hmm. you talk to a lot of people via radio six days a week, yep. uh, two hours a day, yep. uh, financial issues can be heard. You just mm -hmm. Google it and, and you'll be able to find it. Google mm -hmm. Dan Celia, financial, is financial mm -hmm. issues, right? Yes, yes. Financial issues. So, so here's my question. In your travels and your discussions, do you feel like people have a firm grasp of the importance of money, how to manage it, how it works in the kingdom of God? Do you feel like it's taught well from the pulpit or do you constantly feel like people just aren't getting it? It's not being taught. There's not mm. a great understanding of money. Mm. I feel like there's not a great understanding of money, but I also think that there's not a desire by a lot of folks to really understand it. And that's what I love to teach about when I travel about speaking. Uh, you know, one of, the, one of the issues, you know, I, I've got, I'm not making a shameless plug. I have a book coming out called The Fear of Money. And I only say it because the subtitle of the book is called, Have We Separated Our Faith from Our Finance? Yes. We, have. we pray. I always say, you know, I, we pray about everything. I pray about, I, I hope my plan, plane leaves, uh, lands in Terminal B as opposed to Terminal A. We pray about everything. But when it comes to our money, we don't do that. We don't take that. It's, I, it's okay, Lord, I got this. It's my yeah. money. I'm going to take care of it. We also lose the, we've lost and don't want necessarily, I believe, the understanding that it's God's money. We've got to hold loosely to it. We've got to understand where it comes from. And we've got to be a good steward of it because mm -hmm. he is expecting us to be a good steward of what he is entrusting us with yeah. and, and entrusting us to be a good steward of it. So we've got to understand some good uh, principles of, yes, management of finances, getting out of debt, understanding what we have, how we handle it. Mm -hmm. But I think it gets in the way. It gets in the way of our this this greed that even yes we believers have when it comes to our money yeah and it and and if we focus too much on changing our heart and understanding where it comes from and understanding the greed aspect of it then we might have to settle for certain aspects of it what do you and mean I explain believe that would well you in other settle? words what we have mean? to say you mean my uncle harry who's making all this money I, I've got to understand that I need to be prudent, conservative, wise in the handling of my money. And I also have to be uh, happy with what I have and what I'm going to have in the future. I need to be happy with that. I need to come to terms. That's my Uncle Harry or my next door neighbor, or my brother-in-law, this person or that person. It's not, it's not me. I don't feel as though God is going to use me in that way or that God is going to bless me in that way. I, I have what I have. I've got to be a good steward of it. 
it would be wonderful if I have that someday. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I used to tell my kids, it takes a lot of crumbs to make a loaf. And if you're not happy with the crumbs, you're never going to have a loaf. That's good. If all you're going to try to do is get the loaf, you're, you're going to miss all the crumbs along yeah. the way. And you're not going to, you're going to end up with nothing. And we struggle, I think, saying, okay, here's a crumb. I'm happy with that. How do I manage it right? What do I do with it? How do I get another one? How do I get another crumb? And am I willing to give? Well, if I give, I've got less. No, you're going to have more. But if, you know, how do I give? I We're going to have to give. talk about that, though, yeah. Dan, because I, I don't want us to just kind of, you know, slide past that, that discussion. But here, here's the question, you know, there is a fear that I think people have when you start to talk about money. And yeah. you mentioned being able to say, this is the Lord's money and, and entrusting it to him, right? Because he's entrusted it to you to begin right. with, entrusting right. it to him. Where does the fear <clears throat> come from? You know, what, what is... What is this experience that maybe we are unaware of that has happened in, inside of us that we're afraid? Because for most of us, the extent of our financial savvy is our checkbook on our kitchen table in yeah. the morning. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah, I think the fear comes from, from our childhood. I mean, I think we, we, we open our birthday cards wondering if there's $5 in there. <laughs> I think it comes from there. And, and, true. and we learned from the beginning, <laughs> hey, you know, it's a good thing if I have $5. I'm yeah. not sure why, but it's a good thing. Yeah. And if I get 10, that's even better. Mm -hmm. And I think we learn it. And so, we, so take that piece. We're not hearing it from the pulpit anymore. I didn't grow up in the church, but I'm told back in the day that pastors talked about money. Mm -hmm. It was okay. Mm -hmm. The sin of it, the worship of it, and the stewardship of it. They don't do that now. I get called yeah. by pastors, hey, I'm, we're having a campaign. Can I, would you mind speaking, doing some pulpit fill-in and kind of get ready because we're going to launch this campaign? And I always do it. But I always want to say, you're the senior pastor, man. What do you call me for? That's yeah. your job. Yeah. I mean, I, I do it. But our Sunday school classes, are our children learning anything mm -hmm. about the value of money to the kingdom, mm -hmm. the value of the mo money to us, uh, the value of doing things based on needs as opposed to wants? You know, how, do we learn that as children? I don't think we do. So then we get to the point where we're sitting at the kitchen table looking at our checkbook and trying to balance it, and that's all we know. Right. Now, you mentioned this. You said um, we have to come to this point where... We are content mm -hmm. with what the Lord has given us. And, and another word would be satisfied with what the Lord has given us. But at the same time, though, Dan, your, your, kind of, your ministry, though, is teaching people how to multiply Absolutely. what they have. So, Absolutely. So how do you reconcile because, those two things? Well, I reconcile in my heart because it's kind of a selfish thing. Here's the deal. If I can help you do the right things with what God has given you, in this case, your money, if I can help you do the right things, you're going to be more comfortable giving and you're going to have more to give. Yeah. So selfishly, I'm kind of indirectly giving through you to the kingdom. You're advancing now, the yeah, kingdom man, of it's God. Great stuff. So it's wow, a self. This, I, I like a, that. I have a selfish motive here. I mean, so the look, here's the thing. I remember years ago, you, you remember when the first stimulus package came out by the government. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I had my administrative assistant print it because I don't do real good reading on the whole computer thing. It's not, I got to touch it, feel it, highlight yeah, it, you yeah. know, do all that stuff. So it's, it's you know, uh, 1,090 pages is sitting there. And I touched every page and I'm going through it. And I always tell people, look, let me, let me tell you, I've been through it. There is no money in there for the kingdom. Wow. The missionaries we got to keep on the field, no money in there for it. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen. The people that lost their house in a hurricane, no money in there for it, other than the government intervening. But there's no money for Christian ministries. The church doors and the church that has to pay the electric bill, the government's not bailing them out. Right. There's no money in there. Right. Whether you like it or not, God's people need to make sure that the gospel of Jesus Christ can be proclaimed. I like this. I like, let me stop you there, though, okay. because, because somebody is watching right now and, and they equate, you know, amassing riches and amassing wealth 
with these companies that have no face and these corporations that have no God. Right. And so, but what you are saying is that you can multiply your resources, you can be a faithful steward of what God has given you and advance his kingdom. It just sounds smart that God would set things up that way. Well, we know God is a great multiplier. If we are faithful to him, you know, I tell people, where do I start? Give. Do you give? No. Well, there you go. You have to start. You have to start in giving. I believe that we have to give from our heart. Mm -hmm. I don't believe it's, uh, uh, there should be legalism involved in it. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a story if we have time, but it's a moving story. Um, but I had, a, I had a young lady call me once. She was in her late 20s. She, had th she was a single mom. She had three children. She worked all day. She came home. Her, parent, her mom watched the kids. She worked all day. She came home, had some dinner, and went out and worked four more hours in the evening. She did that every single day. And she called up and she said, you talk about giving sometimes. I would love to give, but I can't put gas in my car to get to work. Mm. How do I give? And I said to her, do me a favor. The next time you put gas in your car, if it's $10 worth of gas, would you put nine fifty in? And when you go to church, put the 50 cents. Just would you do that? And I promise you, I said to her, that you're not going to miss the 50 cents worth of gas. Your car is not going to miss it. Your mileage isn't going to change. Nothing's going to change. I promise you, it's 50 cents. Because God knows what you would like to give. He wow. knows your heart. But can you just have that participate in that act of worship that you're missing out on giving? She called me back six months ago. I never, I didn't take it on the air because I was afraid I'd start crying, like I'm about to do now. <laughs> right. Bad, bad television. <laughs> but anyway, but she called back and she said it was the greatest thing anything anybody ever told me. Fifty cents. Yeah. It was fifty cents. And how God multiplied that. She got a new position, not a new job, but a new position. She was making more money. She was able to give more. She was continuing to give. But more importantly, she felt so good yeah. because she was worshiping. Absolutely. She was participating in that worship of God. So look, we can't, all I want to teach and to do. I, I Listen, I want people to understand the stock market and different stocks and, and the way to do things. I want them to understand the economy, the global economy. It's important so that we can be good stewards. Yeah. We need to understand that. But you have to understand, and, and Miki, I say this all the time, that pivotal verse of my, my ministry is uh, uh, Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. And I'm really paraphrasing here, forgive me, Paul. But <laughs> It basically is saying, look, whether you like it or not, now that you are a believer, you have a responsibility to be a steward of the sacred mysteries of God. He's talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah. See, all of our financial stewardship or the stewardship of our talents, gifts, time, whatever it is, has to be understood with, in light of the fact that we first have to be a steward of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How do you do that if you're not a preacher, teacher, pastor, missionary, evangelist? How do you do that? That's for them to do, right? That's what well, we think. That's what we think but we can make sure the gospel is proclaimed. We can do that with our money. Oh, we that's a that. great place for us to take a break. We'll take a quick break, come right back and talk about stewardship <clears throat> expanding or extending beyond just tithing and offering. We're going to talk investments. Oh, I like that. that. That gets me fired up. And that's the my godliness of that. How about that? We'll be right back. Stay close. <laughs> 